Welcome to another episode of The Dissection. Did you know that it has been a hundred days of the GNU? One hundred days of the government of national unity. This coalition between the Democratic Alliance and the ANC plus some other political parties to make it more seem like a real government of national unity. I'm not going to, in this video, debate whether it's a real government of national unity or not. Not at all. I'm just going to analyze and dissect the 100 days of the GNU. 100 days. That's significant. Significant. Globally, they check administrations at this 100-day marker, especially in America. They look at how a president has performed after 100 days. I think it's a good place to also evaluate spiti piti, spiti pitically evaluate this thing. So 100 days since the deal was signed. The GNU deal was signed on the 14th of June, which was 100 days ago, the same day when Parliament elected President Ramaphosa as the president-elect. So today, Sunday the 22nd of September, is 100 days. Question. Are other media houses looking at this 100-day mark? If they're not, then you know that you're in the right place. You know that the dissection is the right place to be. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. About 77% of people watching the video haven't subscribed yet. So hit that subscribe button. Let's get this going. If you're wondering about the other days, right, in terms of where we at in terms of this administration, the president was inaugurated on the 19th of June, which was 95 days ago. The cabinet was announced on the 30th of June, which was 84 days ago. So whichever demarcation you choose to measure, maybe you're going to measure from the inauguration day. So you've got five more days. At this particular point, we can begin to have a clear indication of how this administration is doing. So what questions existed at the beginning of this government of national unity coalition type of talk? What strategic calculations did different parties make going into this deal? What made this deal attractive to the markets and the elites? For the ANC, they needed to stay in power, but they also needed to protect President Ramaphosa and not to derail the markets and the currency. Have they succeeded? For the DA, they said and they intended to prevent Mkonto Wesizwe Party and the EFF from getting into government. That was one of their key priorities. The donors and the owners of capital, they had interest to prevent any progression towards nationalization of mines, of banks, any progression towards the nationalization of the Reserve Bank. Donors bid heavily in the last months on the Democratic Alliance and the IFP. For instance, the IFP got 50 million rands from the Oppenheimers in April and early May. So you can see what the markets and the donors were concerned about. So let's, let's, let's go further. Let's go further. But before we talk about the GNU specifically, the last 100 days have been a movie. They've, they've really been a movie. Some, some of the things that have happened uh, Netflix series in and of themselves. Just think about how dramatic the last hundred days have been. So we know that Chidima Argentina made it to Miss South African top 10. She got pressured out due to home affairs revealing that there were some, uh, you know, insinuations, allegations, or uh, indications that her mother had stolen someone's identity several years ago, 24 years ago. and. Then Chidima left the competition, left Miss Universe South Africa. Then she went on to win Miss Universe Nigeria. That in and of itself is its own movie. It Netflix has an idea, but if you use it, you must come back. Um, pasta Mboro. Pasta Mboro, very popular pasta. He went on a full John Wick at a, at a school and his church was burnt down. He got arrested. Very dramatic scenes. He's out on bail. And ironically, he was in jail for 40 days, 40 nights. Just another movie that we saw. We just saw heavy snow in Guazulu Natal and other parts of South Africa. It froze tra traffic. Unfortunately, some people have actually died from hypothermia as a result of being out, uh, trying to get to particular places in that particular weather. The vice president, Paul Mashatile, collapsed 
dramatically while giving a speech. He's taken a week to recuperate. There, these are just some of the things, just some of the things that have happened in the last hundred days. The list is, is much longer of the dramatic things that have happened politically, socially, musically, culturally. There's a lot that has been happening. What have been some of your highlights in the last hundred days, just the last hundred days since President Ramaphosa was inaug- uh, not inaugurated, elected by parliament, since Helen Ziller and um, Figilem Balula signed this first GNU statement of intent. What has been <laughs> something that stood out for you? Tell me in the comments. I'm keen to have that discussion. Right. Let's talk more specifically about the GNU. There have been a lot of highs for the GNU. Let's start with the highs. Number one, the rand is stronger. It's trading at um, one one dollar is to seventeen point four three. That's the highest that has been in a long while. I think it's the strongest performance in about twenty months or something to that effect. So, part of the narrative going into the signing of the coalition deal was that if you get DA and ANC together in a coalition, the RAND is going to, you know, really get strong. The RAND is going to get healthy and we're going to get seven, one is to 17.5. Well, there it is. There it is. The RAND is stronger. South Africa number two has had an interest rate cut for the first time in four years. That's something significant. Number three, we've seen reductions and the price of fuel. Few fuel reduction prices have, 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 have fuel price reductions have gone in. Number four, electricity still flowing, right? There was this view, and I'm one of the people who had the view that mm, this load shedding ending type of thing is election uh, manipulation. The ANC is trying to buy the people through reduction of, of load shedding. I was very skeptical, but there it is. The electricity is still flowing. That's a positive. That's a po- I'm recording this, this electricity. You know, at some point I bought a big, uh, what is it, power station. And I was going to use it just in case there was load shedding, et cetera, et cetera. I haven't had to use it that much this this year, right? So, I mean, a lot of people installed solar panels, a lot of other things. But electricity is flowing. It's flowing. Number five, international rating agencies are keeping the same rating on South Africa at double B minus with a stable outlook. So. Not not going to a stronger rating, but keeping it the same. That's something that is positive considering the dynamics, considering how many times they reduced it. But double uh, B minus is still not a great rating, but at least it's staying the same. Number five, international rating. Uh, no, I've done that. Number five, I've done it. Number six, we've had lots of success in sports and music. Tyler won a VMA award. Uh, Springboks have been winning left, right, and center. Tatiana won a gold medal at the Olympics. The sprinting team won medals. We've seen strong performances at the Paralympics. No DNA, just RSA has been all over social media. The mood from sports and music has really been very high. Amapiano still dominating the global scene. They're even having Amapiano festivals in Germany, that kind of thing. So when it comes to sports and music, there's been a lot of success. Number seven. Retail trade sales have increased by 2% year-on-year in July with general dealers uh, being the largest largest contributor to growth. That's a positive. Number eight, manufacturing production increased by 1.7% in July 2024 compared with July 2023. The the largest positive contributions were made by the following divisions. Food and beverages, 9.5%. Basic iron and steel, non-ferrous and metal products, metal products and machinery, 5.2%. So some improve, improvements in manufacturing there. For the number, number nine, for the parties within the GNU, there's also positive developments because their strongest opposition has had some rivalry, right? Floyd Shivambu joined the MK party. We saw that created drama, friction within um, the benches of the EFF. Also, we saw the Matozi affidavit directly naming Floyd Shivambu and Julius Malema. So if you are within the GNU, then you're like, yeah, we got our guys. We got those guys. Matozi is going to sink them, right? So these are positives within the GNU. GNU people are very happy about the Matozi affidavit asterisk. Put that asterisk. That asterisk matters. Who are the stars of the GNU? Who's been doing well in this GNU? Hey, right. 
let's be very frank, very honest. People who support the DA and are watching, listen carefully now. Li- listen carefully. Ca- listen. People who, let me, let me, let me give you your flowers. Now nah, I'm, f- I'm a flowers. I'm a bloom. Right. Stars of the GNU, predominantly the DA ministers have been the ones who have received praise from the public about how they have exposed corruption in their departments. Two major examples. Siviwe Kwarube has shown real uh, strong, resolute character and determination. She blocked a 10 billion rand tender for a school nutrition program. This was a tender that they attempted to award um, at the point at which there were still negotiations with within the DA and the ANC. So the speed and the nature of the allocation of the tender was tender was very suspicious to begin with. Then Dean McPherson has exposed 300 million rands of corruption that occurred in his in, in his department in the last administrations. So those are two examples. He also said that he's going to block ministers from upgrading houses. You know, some of the upgrades have been other ways where there's been some tender corruption, some fraud that has happened because, not fraud, but corruption for sure, because some of the curtains that were purchased were purchased at highly, um, you know, inflated prices. He said he's blocking that. No new accommodations are going to be purchased. Everything is on freeze. Live within your means, ministers. This is what he has said. That's been something that has been well received. So DA ministers have been the ones who have received the most praise and They've, they've, they, they are doing well. It's gotten to a point where at some stage there were reports that ANC ministers raised with the ANC that, listen, guys, we're not looking good in this GNU. you got to find something for us to do. And then they were told, no, we're going to get government communications on it. We're going to make sure that we, we, we get you guys positive narratives. We're going to make sure that we do something. They have a real challenge because, you know, new brooms sweep clean. But if you're part of the same team, part of the same political party, even if you are technically a new broom, although you're not a new broom because you just came from another department, there's only so much you can do. You can't come there and say, I found corruption because people will say, but that's your party. So there's there's only so much that can be done. And also ANC ministers were not receiving positive reports uh, from, for instance, Malin Guardian does this thing where they, were, they would rank, um, you know, ministers. And frequently the ANC ministers did not receive positive ratings. So, yeah, they're just in a tricky position. Gayton McKenzie also has been a shining star in this government of national unity. He has benefited from the sporting moments that have been happening. Lots of wins, and he's been there to say, hey, no DNA, just RSA, Baba. So Gayton has been there, and he's been, like, glowing, you know, he's smiling everywhere. He's also become the spokesperson for the coalition at the rugby matches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. His strategy is basically the same strategy that have been u- that was used by the Penguins in the movie Madagascar. You remember the movie Madagascar with King Julian? <laughs> so you remember what the Penguins' their strategy was: smile and wave, boys, smile and wave. That was the whole strategy. Meanwhile, they were busy behind the scenes. <laughs> anyway, the Gates and McKenzie strategy seems to be classic. Smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. And it's working for him. It's working for him. He's actually toned down some of the stuff that he used to speak about very aggressively. He's still very much an Abahambe guy, but at different p- parts of the of the moments, he keeps quiet. Let me give you an example of him keeping quiet in a way that was very peculiar when I observed it. When the Bella Bill was passed, one of the provisions of the Bella Bill is that they shouldn't prevent kids from going to school because they don't have documentation. So even if a child is undocumented, you can't kick them out of a school. That is very anti abahambe That's not his cup of tea. That's not his Coca-Cola. That is not his guinea. That is not his quarter. He's not about that. He doesn't consume that. But smile and wave, boys. Smile and wave. We made a strategic decision. He was like, you know what? I'll campaign against it later. But that's an example. So he's definitely been somebody who's been a shining star. So we've discussed the highs. We've discussed the stars. What are the lows for this particular um, government of national unity and just where South Africa is at right now? And we have to be honest. And a lot of these lows are long standing, right? Unemployment is still high at 42 pace, 42.6% 
on the expanded definition. Three specific groups that I want to mention. Number one, between the ages of 15 to 24, unemployment is at 70.6%. That's not good. Between the ages of 25 to 34, unemployment is at 50.1%. Basically, between the ages of 15 to 34, three, what is it? Yeah, it's about, no, it's, um, what is it? It's about 60%, right? of these people are not in employment, people in this age group. That's not good. That's not good. That's not good. Three out of five South Africans between the ages of 15 to 34 are unemployed. Not good. Overall unemployment for women is higher than the general unemployment at the expanded definition, which was, remember, 42.6. For women, it's at 46.1 also showing that there are still significant challenges with unemployment for young people, for women, right? I'm not going to look at the racial divisions, but generally unemployment is very low for white South Africans, very high for black South Africans. So even on that count, still not good, right? Poverty, still very high. As of 2023, approximately 18.2 million people in South Africa are living in extreme poverty, which is defined as living on less than $1.90 per day, which if you multiply by the 17.43, you can work it out, right? This represents a significant portion of the population and it reflects the ongoing economic challenges that South Africa is facing. In terms of overall poverty rates, about 57% of individuals in South Africa were reported to be living below the national poverty line. It indicates a persistent issue of poverty across the country. Child poverty, particularly alarming, particularly concerning. Around 62.1% of children in South Africa live in poverty. This highlights the vulnerability of the younger populations to economic hardships. So, yeah, rugby is going well. JSC, people are happy. but. Poverty, still high, 62.1% of children in poverty. Manufacturing, I said some good things about manufacturing, but there are some concerning things, especially tertiary manufacturing. When you look at motor vehicles, parts, and accessories, that division went down by 12.1%. That's a significant drop. So there are concerns in the tertiary manufacturing sector. Education quality is still a challenge. Still a challenge. 81% of grade fours cannot read for meaning at the lowest level that the international uh, benchmarks test at. That's not not great. We still know that you've got about 50,000 kids who are passing math with 50% when it comes to matric results. Um, Out of the 750,000 who write, those who write maths are about 250,000. Of that 250,000, only 50,000 pass maths with 50% or higher. The same trend applies to maths literacy. Get about 50,000. So of the 100,000 kids, sorry, of the 750,000 kids who are writing the exams, only about 100,000 get maths at 50% or higher, whether it's maths lit or normal maths. That's not good. That's not good. Quality of healthcare, still a problem. One of the big stories that was ha- that happened in the last 100 days is that of the, I think he's, a, he's, a, he's an activist or journalist, I'm not sure, Tom London, get to go to Helen Joseph Hospital and his treatment there was not great and it captured news attention. And I think part of the reason it captured news attention was to remind certain groups about the problems that exist in the public healthcare system. And sometimes these things, when media picks up certain things, you have to be a little bit skeptical about the extent of the coverage because the problems at Helen Joseph are longstanding. They're not new. But the reason I think the Tom London story picked up a lot in maybe ENCA and those types of news streams, Eyewitness News, Daily Maverick, etc., it was to remind the DA constituency, middle-class South Africa, what happens if they get NHI fully implemented. I think it was something that was done as part of a communications 
agenda, so to speak, right? So quality of healthcare is still a problem. That, regardless of Tom London, it's still an issue. We're just making a side comment. Price of electricity is still going up. Still going up. South Africa remains the most unequal country in the world with the Gini coefficient of 0.67. The crime rate is still very high, especially for contact crimes. These are long-standing lows that we must be cognizant of. So whenever we're having conversations about politics in South Africa, we mustn't forget what the problems are. Part of the reasons why these problems exist, by the way, is because this is an extractive economy. And I've made a video about extractive economies and why they facilitate for monopolies and oligopolies and corruption in politics. They are an extractive economy is opposed to an inclusive economy. You don't have to be a socialist or a communist to have problems with the design of the South African economy. This economy had a lot of companies that got big during apartheid and then leveraged their size to get economics advantages, economic advantages post-1994. If you look at companies like Naspers, you look at companies like Remgro, you look at the history of those companies, you find that uh, Sanlam, you look at the history of those companies, um, even if you look at FNB and all of these companies that are big, you'll find that they have their roots in apartheid and some of them were supporting the apartheid regime heavy. They were heavily supporting it. So when you have four banks, four uh, cellular providers, four everything, that is not a sign of an inclusive economy. It's not a sign of capitalism that is working. It's a sign of broken capitalism. Broken capitalism, right? An extractive economy. So extractive economy also facilitates for lower education levels. I've done a video on this. You can go um, look for it uh, on, my, on, my, on, my, on my YouTube page. But these are some of the things that are the underlying causes of everything that we're seeing here. So let's discuss now the challenges within the GNU. We've looked at the highs. We've looked at the stars. We've looked at the lows. What are the challenges within the GNU? Number one, the NHI is going to present major problems for the unity of the coalition. DA voters are medical aid users and they are relatively older, meaning that they are dealing with chronic health issues or they have relatives with chronic health issues. The concerns about NHI are that they will be forced to use public hospitals. That is something that will not easily be stomached. Think about this. Middle class and rich South Africa has created a parallel system of life for themselves. They use private security. They have boom gates in their neighborhoods. They have private transportation. They, they drive to in, in their nice cars, the Havals now, but Range Rovers, whatever, you name it, right? to these private schools. Private transportation, they use Uber. The only time that they use public transport is either the Hau train or the blue trains that Lucky Montana bought when they are going to rugby games. Apparently those blue trains now work. Story for another day. They send their kids to predominantly private schools, right? With the exception of the former Model C schools, Quintile 5, Quintile 4 schools, which they have been able to control through school governing bodies. So, this idea of being forced to go to a public hospital is one that is going to create irrational fear and even rational concerns, right? So it's not just all going to be irrational. People who support the DA are definitely not going to be interested in NHI being rolled out. So it's going to be an even bigger fight than the Bella Bill. The Bella Bill was round one. So I think this is going to be a major challenge for this particular coalition. And there are legitimate concerns about the NHI. There are legitimate concerns. It's, it's a good idea, but I think people are concerned about the ANC's track record in execution and issues of corruption, et cetera, et cetera. So they're, they're, these are legitimate concerns. The Bella Bill has already shown the fractures of the coalition. I think that the DA backed down from walking away because President Ramaphosa gave them a face-saving gesture. The three-month suspension of the language provision and the other clauses, right? Two clauses that were suspended. 
But I don't know if they'll be able to get that kind of a concession with NHI. So NHI is going to be a real challenge. The dynamics at the city levels could also create more animosity between the DA and the ANC. The ANC and Action SA made a deal. This is ANC in Gauteng. They made a deal that allowed Dada Moreiro to become the mayor of Johannesburg. The other side of the deal was that Action SA would get Twane mayorship. Currently, Twane is run by the DA and has been since 2016. Right? As a side note, the DA has not really been able to do well in Twane. They've not been able to you know, produce clean audits. They've not been able to provide delivery to areas like Social Nguve, which was in a way that is better to the ANC. It's been the same, right? Uh, I heard a um, leader at a business school, actually, who lives in Swane, say that it's been some of the worst administration that he's seen. Right? This was during uh, a discussion at Gibbs, right? So, so that's a side note. The DA has really been throwing out their toys in respect to this. They've been fighting Herman Mashaba on the internet. Just go to Twitter. You'll see the kind of catfight that is happening between the DA and, the, and, and Action SA. And they are primarily trying to blame Action SA for leaving the coalition, the Moonshot Pact. But on the, on the other side, there's obviously going to be some scathing sentiment towards the ANC. And I'm not sure if, you know, if they lose Tswane, whether they will keep playing for much longer, right? Because Bella Bill is a defeat. Being kicked out of the coalition in Johannesburg is its own defeat. Remember, um, Panyaza already pulled moves on them at, at the provincial level. Uh, you know, so there, there, there are some issues that the DA has got bad blood about right now between them and the ANC. These are challenges. What are the challenges for President Ramaphosa? The Palapala matter is not gone. It's still going to be heard at the Constitutional Court. And depending on how that is argued, it could end up back in Parliament. Right? This is something that is going to be on President Ramaphosa's mind. Remember, when the issue was blocked in Parliament, they said, no, we, this thing is, is flawed. We want to, and they were talking about the Section 89 report, we want to take this issue on a review. We'll take it to the courts. The document is flawed. They with, President Ramaphosa withdrew that legal challenge. He withdrew it. It's gone. That, that determination of the Section 89 panel still stands. It's unchallenged. And when the EFF takes this to court, it may very well be that the court may rule that it was irrational to remove it in the manner that it was removed from parliament and take it back. What, Pal what the Section 89 report found was that there were prima facie uh, indications that the president had violated the constitution and other laws and that an impeachment committee had to be set up to look into this further, to do the proper investigation. The matter is still with the NPA. They have not progressed with their investigation. Obviously, the NPA is not going to necessarily move on this. Shamil Abatoui is appointed by the president. There's a conflict of interest there. Minister of Justice also appointed by the president. There are some conflicts of interest here that we've not really been very honest about. But that matter is still there. It's a challenge for President Ramaphosa because he has to explain how he got all of that money into his sofas Forex that was not declared according to SARS came into the money under into the country under funny manners. And ever since that guy spoke to Sky News, he's gone. He's disappeared. He's never come back. Uh, Mustafa. Because the DA, remember, DA actually checked to see whether or not the papers that he was showing everybody were legit. Because he said, I declared the money, blah, 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 blah. And then DA checked and SARS said, aye, we don't know. This guy didn't declare anything. Right. And even the Reserve Bank had to make a questionable call on the uh, the the matter saying that the transaction is not perfected. Look, guys, we have to be honest. You know, presidents receive a lot more protection than we like to think. You know, whether it's Zuma, you know, people like to say, no, it's a fire pool, squint a little bit. Can you not see? There's thatch, there's a pool. If you put a pipe and you go boop, fire pool. <laughs> and the day I heard that, I, I laughed so hard and I was so shocked by how incredulous the explanation was. There are versions of that in this Pala Pala matter. I don't want to lie to you. It is what it is. 
You can see it. Whether you support the man or not, you can see it. The matter is still going to the Constitutional Court. It may not be this year, but next year, definitely, they're going to hear it. They can't delay it forever. That's something that's going to be on the cards. The Minister of Justice is compromised. It's a challenge for President Ramaphosa. The story that she gave does not add up. I've done a, an episode of that. You can go check it up, right? So if you notice a little bit, the story around uh, Minister Temin Gadimen has actually died down a bit, right? And the VBS energy has also died down a bit because it's like the mainstream media has realized that we can't keep beating this drum because this is going to place the president in a very tricky position. And if if he, if he if he doesn't make a decision, it exposes that, you know what, step aside is not so strong for everyone, right? Because VBS is supposed to be this big issue that everyone cares about because the grandmothers in Limpopo lost their money. And here you've got somebody who has been implicated in VBS who's your minister of justice. Mm. And also, he's got challenges because if he makes a decision to remove her or shuffle her, that also exposes a contradiction. Because if he says, no, let's allow investigations to unfold. But when you are conflicted, a minister of justice cannot oversee the NPA that is investigating her. Then by implication, a president cannot oversee a minister of justice that is investigating him because the minister of justice oversees the NPA. NPA is investigating you. So if she's conflicted, you're conflicted. Just obvious logic, right? So there's a challenge here. It's a challenge, right? It may just remain in the air as a challenge. I'm just pointing out the challenges, right? There's tension within the NPA and the Minister of Justice on the Zondo Commission data that affects the ANC more broadly because several other people were named there. So if there's a continuation of prosecution, serious figures within the ANC like Gwede Mentashe may, may face uh, prosecution. They don't want that. That's a challenge for President Ramaphosa because there's a bigger picture at play. What's the bigger picture? A second-term president has significant influence only in the first two years of his term of office. After that, the markets, the donors, and the streets begin to look into the future. Local government elections are coming up in 2026, and the ANC conference is coming up in 2027. There's life after presidency. So you don't want to make, you don't want to like have your party totally lose, and you don't want to have significant leaders within your party becoming your enemies and opponents if they are still going to be around post you occupying the highest seat that you can ever occupy, which is president. After that, you become influential, you you come to talks, etc., etc. You become what Tabo Beg is doing. Maybe you have a foundation, etc. But if your party doesn't support you, you can have problems. So there's a bigger picture and it's a challenge for President Ramaphosa because he knows, and I'm sure he can feel, which, okay, certain people I can no longer tell what to do the way I used to because now they are next and my time is ending, right? So he has to think about the wishes of his party base more. And there's still a big, big challenge that he has, right? And that challenge is how the coalition is perceived by the grassroots of the ANC. The base of the party is left-leaning. The coalition partners, South African Communist Party and COSATU, the labor side of the party more broadly, represent a base that views itself as antagonistic to the owners of capital and the elites and winners of capitalism. That is what they, they view themselves to be. This coalition and the Ramaphosa administration more generally are viewed as a pro-capital, pro-neoliberal coalition. And this manifests in the privatization of state-owned enterprises, austerity measures, low salaries for the public sector, and cuts to key programs such as education. We've already seen the Western Cape government is announcing job losses for teachers. They're announcing that about 3,000 teachers are going to lose their jobs because of these austerity measures. The people who are most opposed to this type of approach, privatization, austerity, low salaries for the public sector, are within the ANC, the left-leaning grassroots movement of the ANC, the workers, the communists, the 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 socialists, these are people who are within the ANC. ANC is a left-leaning party at the base because the base is largely affected by the issues we discussed earlier, crime, poverty, unemployment. And they view some of the issues of the extractive 
economy as, you know, being product of the neoliberal economic design. They're very critical of Tabombegi and his approach. And they're very critical of President Ramaphosa and of this coalition. It's a challenge for him because there's going to be another election. This was not the last election forever and ever. Amen. Right? This is not our father, the prayer. There's more after this. And these are challenges for him. Challenges that exist for John Stainazen, leader of the Democratic Alliance, going into 100 days of GNU. Number one, he's not looking good at, as an administrator. He had, why is he not looking good? Because number one, he chose some bad people to defend and made a bad appointment for his chief of staff that he then asked to step down. And it's not even clear whether that person has stepped down yet because there are processes that have to happen in, in labor law. You can't just, after you've gone through all the process, I had somebody just say, I know, chief, leave. Even if it's a political appointment and you chose that person for political reasons. I'm talking here about the right-wing podcaster, Roman Kabanak, who John hired to be his chief of staff. That whole process was messy. The Ronaldo House issue was messy as well. And John has an office as the uh, um, minister. As every minister has got their office. He has 11 employees that he has to appoint. He has not appointed one. He's lost the one that he appointed. And he tried to appoint four who did not have the qualifications as per the requirements. Then he applied for a deviation. That's also been covered quite extensively. I made a video about it as well. And he's not looking good. He's not looking good administratively. This is a challenge for him. He's not the standout performer in the DA amongst the ministers. He's not the standout performer, right? By the way, for the DA supporters who are watching, we have to be honest about everybody. We can't just be honest about ANC or EFF or MK and then you get a pass. Everybody gets the same honesty, the same scrutiny. While I gave credit to the DA earlier in the video for the performances of the other ministers, Dean McPherson, Sivuwe Harube, it's clear that you can't be at 84 days without having staffed your office and, and that not be a criticism. It's a fair criticism. Criticisms of his hiring decisions linger. People are not happy with the performance of John Stainazen. And I think some of those concerns are fair. Donors and power brokers in the party may want him to step down in the next party, in the next leadership contest. I think that he has significant challenges that he's aware of. And whatever dynamics of the NHI and the Bella Bill, he is going to be held accountable for the decisions that are made. So let's go back to the key questions, right? Is this coalition still valuable for its participants? At this point, in spite of everything that I've said, yes, the mood is still good for many who support this coalition. There are wins in rugby. There are wins over here, wins over there. People are happy. People are excited. They want the GNU to continue. The GNU is pretty much still in the honeymoon. Is this coalition going to last? Yes, I think it's going to last. I think that Mr. Ramaphosa will buy time on the NHI. And... Even though he does that, I think it will create a long-term risk. Let's assume, for instance, that Panyaza Lesufu wins the conference. It's most likely going to be Paul Mashatile. But with his collapse on the stage, you can't be 100% sure. But uh, let's assume for conversation that Panyaza wins. He will push ahead with the NHI. And he is very aggressive with rolling out policy. He, he doesn't play with the rolling out of policy. He will think of an idea this week, two weeks later. It's going to happen. Look at Ama Panyaza, you know, those uh, community safety wardens. He rolled those out very fast, spent a lot of money. He didn't. He doesn't hesitate. So, right, I think Mr. Ramaphosa is going to buy time on this particular issue of the NHI. So that's going to give John some breathing room. And I think the DA is not going to walk away from the coalition. They are too invested. So even if they lose certain fights, NHI, Bella Bill, whatever comes next, they're not going to walk away. The stakes are too high. The stakes are in their mind. We leave and then land get nationalized. Banks get nationalized. Mines get nationalized. We leave and then the EFF and the MK come in. DA does not want EFF and MK to taste power, right? People who are still stuck in the state capture fight. Don't want Jacob Zuma or anybody related to Jacob Zuma anywhere close to power anymore. They spend a lot of time fighting that man, resisting that man. If they view the DA as being the buffer between the return of Jacob Zuma, they will force the DA to stay in that coalition and eat their vegetables, whether they like it or not. 
That's a reality. So this coalition is going to last till the next election. That much is a given. And I think Panyaza Lusufi knows that. And they may as well lose Twane as a result of that, but I don't think they're going to walk away. Right? So the coalition is still valuable. The coalition is going to last. The coalition, I don't think, is going to address many of the long-term structural problems. I think that this coalition is going to manage them. Extractive economy, poverty, unemployment, miseducation. I don't think they're going to address a lot of these things because those things require you to have hard conversations with the people who are holding the wealth, who are in affluent positions in South Africa, who just spent a lot of money funding the DA and the IFP to make sure that those parties have... Do you know the DA maintained more or less its position in South African politics? But if you look at the cost, they spent a lot of money to do that. And that money came from particular individuals, M Michelle Leroux being one of them, right? Um, the owner of Capitec. You look at the Oppenheimers. They spent a lot of money. I'm going to do a video just explaining how much money was spent, but they spent a lot of money on this. A lot of money was spent, right? So it's not going to address any of the challenges. And the kind of people who spent a lot of money funding the DA and the IFP, they don't want the system to change uh, much. They are happy with this and they are happy to buy time, hoping that the MK will maybe fall apart. Maybe Jacob Zuma will get sick. Maybe he'll pass away. These are things that they say. This is what they are hoping for. This is what they're hoping for, that you know, EFF maybe will continue to decline. We'll see. We'll see what happens, but they're not, they're not going to change any of these things. So, right. Does this coalition deal stop the, this coalition, the GNU, stop the decline of the ANC? One of the things we must not forget, in as much as we have conversations where the EFF is discussed, they fell from 10% to, to, to 9.5, et cetera, et cetera. Right, the ANC has really been in free fall. The ANC has gone from 62% to 40% in the Ramaphosa years. That's a whole DA that they've lost in terms of support base. A whole party, they've just lost the whole DA, right? That's how significant it is. 22% decline. And it doesn't look like that decline is slowing down. It was from 62 to 57, right? That's 5% then 17% in the next election. If, if that's a trend, have they stopped that trend? I don't think they'll stop the decline because it looks like they won't get back KZN. I don't think they'll get KZN back. And they'll be facing challenges in Gauteng going into the next election. They won't get KZN back because of the existence of the MK party and MK supporters and people in KZN, some of them are not happy that they voted MK and then they got IFP and DA and ANC. That's not an expression of their will. Not really. The mandate was not given to those parties. Of course, in a democracy, you can form a coalition and govern, but the mandate, the mandate comes from who had the most, right? So MK did not win outright, but they had the plurality of the votes at 45%. They had a higher vote share in, how, in, in KZN at 45% than the ANC had nationally. And the ANC is governing the country. They're not governing the province. There are some people who are going to be very angry about that. And I don't think that the ANC is going to just be able to come back and give them flowers and say, askis. I don't think that's going to happen. Also, I think the other challenge that the ANC is going to face is that they will have a new leader in the next election. They will, because President Ramaphosa cannot run for a third term. All right? And I don't think that they'll have someone as market-friendly as Mr. Ramaphosa. They just won't. So the donor rands, the market concerns, the donor rands are going to flow heavily to rivals. Markets are going to try to find other people to back, other parties to support. I think that the ANC is going to have a very tough election in the next election, the next national election. Because President Ramaphosa was the dream candidate for the private sector. He, he's the guy that they were calling for for years and years when he was out of politics. He must come back, et cetera, et cetera. He came back. He was their guy. He was, you know, they, there was so much ramaphoria. I remember Zapiro used to draw him as the Black Panther. You know, he, he drew him as the Black Panther, Ramapanther. That's how he drew him. Um, 
and and he was their guy. So when he's gone, a lot of goodwill that he has been providing to the ANC through his own personality and character and brand, I don't think that it's going to continue to extend to the ANC. Will the ANC get the same support from the markets, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, if it's led by Ronald Lamula, Figile Mbalula, or Panyaza Lesufi, or Paul Mashatile? I don't think so. I think that there will be real panic within the suburbs of South Africa, Western Cape, and many other parts where people are really concerned about some of the politics these individuals have raised. Not to say that the politics is wrong, but they, the, they are politics that definitely Stellenbosch does not support. So that will be a challenge for the ANC. They may even get to 35 30% in the next election. It's a real challenge. I think that this coalition buys them time and the hope is that they can find some wins, re-strategize, regroup. But when, when a party no longer has strong leaders at the top, can it sustain momentum? I don't know. I don't think so. I think that the DA is going to come out stronger from this coalition. Typically, a coalition has winners and losers. I think that the DA is going to come out stronger from this coalition. They are already having strong performances in the by-elections. I think those will continue. I think that the DA ministers are looking much better than the ANC ministers within that coalition. And also, the DA still has a move that the ANC doesn't have in the same way. The DA leader currently is not very popular. The party is more popular than the leader. If they change party leader at some point, they are likely to get a positive bump in attention. They've got so many options that they can pick from at this particular point that will be popular. You know, they can go for Mayor Papas. They can go for Siviwe. They can go for um, the Minister of, of Communications um, as well. And those are all going to be positive uh, choices that people will be like, oh, yeah, this is refreshing, it's different from the DA. So the DA has got a lot of talent that they can choose and they can restart the conversation. But the person who comes after President Ramaphosa is not necessarily going to have the same brand status as President Ramaphosa. Right now, he's the most popular leader in the ANC. That's the challenge that they have. I also think that the Patriotic Alliance is going to come out stronger, but they need to be careful because you can't have a one-man show long-term. You have to build your structures. And if they want to grow in Kauteng, they have to find strong candidates for local government. Right now, they had long, a strong performance in Northern Cape and Western Cape. They have to fix their performances in the other provinces. The risk on relying on one person too much is if there's a major scandal affecting that person or that person gets sick or whatever, then it's game over. It's game over. In as much as, you know, there have been scandals around or accusations around Julius Malema, Floyd Jivambu. The EF have built out a strong operation and they spread um, their structures across the country. Th to get from a few hundred thousand to millions in terms of votes, you need to have a strong operation. You can't be a one-man show or anything to that effect. And that's going to be something that the Patriotic Alliance has to figure out. That's going to be something that they have to figure out. So that's where I think everything stands. 100 days into the GNU. What are your thoughts on this particular GNU period? You're in the GNU era now. What do you think? Do you think that South Africa is headed in the right direction, wrong direction? Do you think that the GNU is headed in the right direction, wrong direction? Let's have a conversation in the comments. Till the next one.